This presentation is designed for folks with children K through three, but if you have older kids, everybody's welcome. I'm packing in 90, a 90 minute workshop I've done in the past to 30 minutes. I hope this works. So we will have some time as needed for questions or comments. And I'm going to go ahead and jump right into it. Julie Shiro is going to help me, another advising teacher, with letting folks in that are late and also checking the chat room. So if you will please mute your microphone so we don't have a lot of echo and static. And if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and put them in the, in the chat and Julie will help me with that. All righty. So, my goal here today is to help build your language arts program through practical recommendations that can be added to any curriculum. So I know we have a, a broad range of, uh, you know, ages here of grade levels, and also that many of you are using one curriculum and another using another. So these are things that I would suggest you add to your curriculum. Let's go over a few basics and get some things out of the way first that I wanna make sure you, you understand if you're new to homeschooling, new to teaching literacy. The writing progress that we're looking at is linked to reading progress. So we're often evaluating writing as a response to reading. So it's very rare that we would just ask kids to write something um, you know, without having provided any material ahead of time. Another thing, the English language is confusing and full of contradictions in the eyes of a child. And we'll talk more about that in a few slides. There's a difference also between surviving the curriculum and a contagious passion for learning. And my friends, kids know the difference. They know when we're just beginning with today, we're going to finish chapter two, pages 296 through 30. And when you say today, we are going to talk about theme or plot. Today, we're going to look at verbs and we're going to, we're going to learn how to use those effectively. Okay. And the main thing I want you to know, homeschoolers, and any traditional teacher. Some days are better than others. We all have days we have, you know, the best laid plans just fall apart. The next day we get up and we begin again. So I have included seven recommendations to supplement or enhance your curriculum. And don't worry about trying to take notes, write them down. We have 30 minutes. I have them all here for you afterward and we'll Get those out to you. My recommendations are based on the following. First of all, research and training. My, my training um, in, as a credential teacher, my master's degree was in policy versus practice as it pertains to reading instruction. And I, I use Vygotsky and the, construction, the constructivist <laughs> theory a lot in, uh, when I'm developing curriculum and you know, putting curriculum together. It is also based on my experience and just working with kids as a teacher and as a parent, and it's based on intuition. And I'm talking about the same intuition that you have as a mother or father. So I wanna just say very quickly, I usually spend a little bit more time on this, but uh, our expectations differ greatly from many other developed countries. Our, our, we live in a culture that pushes, pushes, pushes kids way too young in the eyes of other developed countries. Over the past decade, there's been a lot of controversy on what is considered valid research on how children learn to read and how progress is measured. And I'll leave that for another time as well. But this was part of my master's thesis. So one thing that we all, I think, agree on is we know that motivation is key to reading progress. So I want you to think back 
to your own childhood and and maybe you could share with us maybe a couple people could share what encouraged you or discouraged you to read more think specifically about those experiences that motivated you intrinsically so i'm not talking about getting stickers or you know we everybody's guilty in the the old days of you know pizza uh pizzas for however many books you read these kinds of things are extrinsic rewards and they might work for a time, for a short time, but all the research shows that they don't last uh, for very long. And what we really need to do is think about those things that motivate children intrinsically. So does anybody wanna share? I've heard some very sad stories about things that discouraged I'll go ahead and get it started for you, Sandra. Thanks. Um, I think for me, um, it was seeing my mom reading a lot. Um, screen time was limited. Um, and just seeing her relax with a good book and she would order books and I would order books and we'd lay down and read sometimes together, sometimes separately, but just seeing that um, and her joy of reading, I think really motivated me to understand why she liked it so much and so now I'm that person where I'm I like to get lost in a good book so that was my oh, motivation I love that I love that anybody else feel free to unmute and talk if you'd like to share hello this is Elizabeth I don't know uh, if you can see me or not but um for me it was just my mom uh she used to take us to the library a lot and we would just hang out in the library you know, on a weekly basis, and we would get to check out as many books as we wanted. And so we were always just looking for different books that piqued our interests, and it just encouraged us to read more. Great. Very similar to Julie's. I, I'll tell you that I did not come from a reading family, and my childhood was quite a, a wild ride. And I uh, found an escape in libraries and in books, something I could always count on. And, and, you know, in stories. So um, anybody else? Yeah, I'll share something because um, I'm Hi. on the other side. I did not enjoy reading as a child. Mm. And the reason that I didn't like it is because it was a solitary event. And I mm. was and still am a very social person. And so to me, reading meant I had to be by myself and like no talking, no, in, like there was no interaction. So that was, for me, that's the reason I didn't do a whole lot of reading as a child. As an adult, I read more than I did, but that was, it was hard to motivate me to separate out and read. That, that's interesting. And, and maybe that is uh, something that we don't think about enough, you know, with our, in, with our extroverts, um, with our kids that are extroverts, maybe um, this is something that we can address. And, and I'm going to talk about readers theater and shared reading experiences a little bit more. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? I was going to say, I, I, I never enjoyed reading. I, my mom did all the right things except for set the example, I would say, but how could she, I guess that she doesn't enjoy it, you know? So mm -hmm. I don't, I don't enjoy reading at all to this day. I am, it has to be something I'm really, really interested in. But I think what really helped at, at a younger age when I did start to realize reading can be fun is actually reading things that I enjoyed. So I liked mysteries and things like that. So once I found my niche of like what I liked to read, then I was more apt to, but I still never enjoyed it. And um, I probably more like Miss Vaccaro, I would rather maybe do the arts and tell me the story and then I'll do something interactive another way. But I just don't like reading words. <laughs> Great. I love every, that everybody's, you know, just being honest and sharing and, you know, these challenges. And then we, we are going to teach kids this. How do we yeah. motivate them? So thank you for sharing. Did I get everybody? I was okay. going to say basically the same thing. As I, had, I had to find something that was interesting. It took a really long time. Um. But once I did, then I, I loved it. And I still like that if there's a book that has something that's interesting content, I can't put it down. But if, I, if I'm if i not interested in what I'm reading, I'm probably not going to finish it or it's going to take me a really long time. Great. Okay. 
If I can listen to it and read it, then I'm on board. But my mind goes other places. So I think the fact we have technology to where we can listen and look at the same time, Mm -hmm. that's the way to go, I think, for someone who's not motivated on their own. That makes sense. Yep. Anybody else? I'll say something. Um, I was not motivated. I was not a reader as a child. And I associated it with, I think, quality time with my mom, um, because I I had a desire to read. um, But I wanted to read with her and she didn't have time to. Oh, yeah. Wow. I've tried to be purposeful with my kids that if they want to read or I've always sat down and read with them so that they would have that desire to do that. And it was still, and it was quality time with me as well. Wow. Yeah. Great comments. And I, I want you to know that I have heard this, I've done this workshop and, you know, you know, a little differently over several years. And I hear this over and over and over again, that sharing that joy of reading with a parent was intrinsically motivating. Um, Anybody else before I go on that wanted to share that didn't get to? Okay, thank you. So I just wanna say that having soulful experiences with literature or a topic about the reading makes a difference. And it's not just a feel good kind of things, it's science. And there's a lot of research to back this up. So first recommendation, and again, you don't have to write these down, I'm going to give them to you at the end of this presentation, is design a balanced language arts program that consists of both reading and writing instruction where you're teaching how to read, but also number two, and very important, a piece that is comprehension and critical thinking, writing activities based on material that you will need to read to them. And this might go on for years and years, vitally important that they're getting that rich vocabulary that they can't read themselves yet. So keep reading to them, even when they begin to read. So often parents just you know, let that part drop off. Um, So how do you know your child is ready to read? Let me go here. I'm going to use, I I found a great resource last year and she's given me permission to use her little videos here. Are you ready? This is Alana, Alana in Canada. Are you wondering what it takes to teach your child to read? How do you know when your child is ready? Are you worried about turning them off of reading or butting heads as you begin the process? Teaching your child can feel really overwhelming. There are a lot of moving parts, and that's why I'm here to help. I'm Alana, founder of Artful Teaching Joyful Learning, and I help educators teach with confidence, ease, and a splash of creativity so that their kids fall in love with learning. Now, as a resource teacher in my former life, working with teachers and students, I was able to spy on other teachers' classrooms and get a ton of great ideas. These teachers inspired me to raise the bar, and one in particular, the reading recovery teacher, had a profound impact on my practice with her simplified tools for teaching reading. She had a giant tickle trunk of ideas, many of them very hands-on and very playful, and I couldn't help myself from eavesdropping every time she did a lesson. These struggling kids learn to read so quickly with confidence, ease, and fluency. Now, I took those strategies that she used with those kids and I applied them to my own practice and later on with my own three girls. I was amazed at how quickly the children picked up skills to enable them to confidently pick up a book at their level and read for pleasure. Now, how do we know if a child is ready to read? Well, there are a few telltale signs. The first is your child's interest in environmental print. That is the print that surrounds them in their world. Now these could be restaurant signs, store signs, street signs, basically anything in your child's environment. The second telltale sign is that their concepts of print are rock solid. Your child knows how to hold a book correctly, how to turn pages correctly, where to find the print on the page, and differentiates between a letter and a word. Another sign that your child is ready to start to learn to read is that they have strong phonemic awareness. 
Phonemic awareness is like your child's ability to play with language. So they're able to segment words. They're able to blend words. So k, at, says cat. And this is all done auditorily. They're able to isolate beginning sounds. So take the k away from cat. What are you left with? At. And they have a good rhyming vocabulary. And finally, the last telltale sign that your child is ready to learn to read is that they're pretending to read. They pick up those familiar books they know and they read them from memory. They're showing an interest in being read to more and more and they are reading for pleasure, picking up a book over and over again. Now, are you ready for the three tools to teach your child to read? The first strategy is called a picture walk. Now, prior knowledge, this is our brain's way of assimilating new information. Connecting with what we already know helps to wire our brains so that they can absorb new information coming in. A picture walk is a simple technique to get our children thinking about what they will be reading. It uncovers new vocabulary and gives the brain some Velcro to hold on to the new meaning that they are making. Now, how do we do this? So find a just right book, a book at your child's level. Look closely at the cover and the title. Talk to your child about what they think the book might be about. Now cover the text as you go through the book, looking closely at each picture. At this point, you may even introduce some of the characters' names in the story that might be a bit unfamiliar to your child. Now, once again, we're firing up your child's prior knowledge so that the new meaning coming in, the new information coming in, is able to hook itself onto your child's experiences and they're able to connect it with things that they already know. The next strategy has to do with these dot stickers. It's called dot sticker fingers. Now, one of the most important tasks your budding reader is going to need is to be able to track print using one-to-one -one correspondence from left to right. Matching voice to print is a skill that requires your child to slow down and carefully notice the words that he is reading. One of these stickers can help. Place a dot sticker on Peter Pointer and allow your child to track the print from left to right. This bright sticker ensures your child carefully attends and does not just read through memory or with haste. Once when I was teaching grade one, I had one of my students proclaim, look, Miss Chernecki, I can read with my eyes closed. The dot sticker ensures that your child is really carefully noticing each and every word as they read it. The next tool is called the cut up sentence strip. Writing is the reciprocal process to reading and the two go hand in hand like peanut butter and jelly. Take a passage like a single sentence from your child's early reader. Read the sentence out slowly and print it on a strip of paper. Read each word slowly as you write it. Later on, when your child develops a bit more confidence with writing, they can do the writing piece. Next, cut each word slowly as you read the words again. Snip, snip, snip. Finally, ask your child to put the sentence together back like a puzzle, reading each and every word. Glue it onto a piece of paper and then have him draw a picture to match. Now, one quick bonus strategy, it's called the sound sort. If you have a pre-reader who is still working on their letters and sounds, one great way to warm up is through something called a sound sort. Place some masking tape on your table in the shape of a T. Pick two consonants that you can contrast. So for example, a B and a T. Invite your child to take a paper bag and to find all of the little objects in the house that start with the B, B, B sound place them in the bag, and then again with the T sound, T, T, T. Once your child's returned with the items, dump them into a big pile, invite them to sort according to beginning sound. I hope you've enjoyed these strategies. And if you're looking for help with your budding reader or writer, please join me for my live workshop called Teach Your Child to Read and Write the Simple Playful Way. Details are down below. And that... Uh has already passed, but she, it's a great re resource. I should disclose that it's uh, a for-profit, but she gives away a lot of freebies. Um, and I, and I love all of her little, you know, six minute uh, videos. So we'll, we'll come back to one soon. Can you see my screen? Okay, Julie? Again? Yes. Okay, yes, so, you're good. So implementing this component one, I'm talking about explicit reading instruction where you are teaching reading begins as you saw with phonemic awareness, different from phonics. Phonemic awareness is an auditory uh, process, you know, where they're hearing it. We're not expecting them to do any worksheets 
on phonics at this age. But there's more to decoding than just phonics and phonemic awareness. There's also syntax. When uh, a child begins to understand, you know, does a word make sense in that position in a sentence? Very, very difficult for English language learners because positions might be alternate, you know, uh, from, from English. And then context. Allow your children, encourage your child to use the pictures and other words and phrases before um, and after in connection to that picture. And then we're looking at developing fluency. And that just means reading with ease to getting to where they can read a passage the way they speak. So for a long time, there was this false dichotomy. You know, should we eat phonics or whole language? And most educators would agree that both phonics and a whole language approach is needed in order to teach reading. So uh, I'm, I'm going to skip this part for the sake of time. Uh, a lot of you, I wanted to show some of the, the curriculum that we had that are that we use to for explicit reading instruction, but most of you already know primary phonics, sing, spell, read, and write, and other things where you have leveled readers and you know where the complexity of uh, patterns of English grows. Um, the problem is this: 80% of our English language is phonetic or follows some kind of pattern. 20% makes no sense to young children or English learners. So expect this confusion to show up in their writing into fifth grade or beyond. Let me show you what I mean. Take a look at this. You notice in the first line here, I will read this thing. So we've taught that TH makes the th sound, but not so in this, right? I just read that. I want a read book though. This book is messed up. Still, I'm starting to understand the various genres of literature. Did, did you notice that that suffix ed and messed really sounds like a t, right? So you're going to get a lot of writing that that suffix is they're going to be putting a T on there because it, it's one of those things that doesn't make sense to a child. And then this, this, I put this on here, the various genres of literature. We don't even have that sound in the word genre in our English language. There are some uh, words, 20%, that they're just going to have to commit to memory as a whole word, as a whole word or phrase even. So I'm going to suggest in addition to whatever you're using that there's times when you chunk sight words or vocabulary words into groups. So uh, a good thing is to, a good practice is to read the word aloud within a sentence, emphasizing that word and then let them choose between words that you have put together in a group so that they begin to uh, make a, you know, create a construct of groups of words. For example, question words. You know, those are difficult. They don't make sense um, when they're trying to decode. So you just have to commit those to memory. Another thing that you can use, now we're going to move into talking about older children. So seven and eight year olds that you are trying to work now with fluency. One thing that you can do that we've done a lot here uh, in tutoring our students is echo reading. A couple of teachers I know that, uh, you know, just trying to fill in some gaps with, with students, we use echo reading. And that is where you read a passage, maybe a whole paragraph, and then ask that student to repeat what you just read. And what the, the idea with echo reading is they might at a younger age or a struggling age, just echo one sentence, then a paragraph, and then eventually a whole page or a whole chapter. Another thing that is useful is choral reading. For choral reading, I really suggest that you have two books of the, the same book so that you're sitting on the other side of the table with a child and here's a sneaky thing you can do. Keep a little, uh, a little pad of sticky notes 
and make some notes on the words that you're, you see your child struggling with in echo or cor choral reading and add those words and words like that to their existing spelling list. So for example, if they struggle at the word would, you know, I would like to go add to the spelling list that you already have would, should, could, et cetera. So in, in uh, teacheries, and some of the schools that are uh, running a reading program, we would call this running records. And so in a very formal way, we would be seeing are those, you know, what are they replacing those words with so we can strengthen those reading cues of syntax or phonics or using context clues. How can we strengthen something they're forgetting there? But you as a parent can just take, take note of what you see them missing and personalize that spelling list. Use poetry and song lyrics. I use in my classes, uh, this is to develop fluency. Uh, the Octopus's Garden is a song and a book and go through this with your children and allow them to sing their reading. Madeline, books like this that are one long poem. This helps children, you know, begin to, to see and hear the patterns of English. And it's just fun. Use reader's theater. This is a sneaky way to get your kids to read more, you know, without it being drudgery. Use scripts with children that are just beginning to read. Reader's theater causes them to have to read everybody's part because they don't want to miss their part. But I would say front load some of the vocabulary they're going to encounter in that. Reread your scripts, reread it, allowing them to make puppets or, you know, props and, you know, say, let's practice it again. This time, let's add sound effects. Most second, third graders love to do reader's theater. And I know here at school, we, we have reader's theater going even in the fifth and sixth grade. Okay, we've talked about teaching reading. We're running out of time. I know some of you might have to go. It's 30 minutes is already up, but I'll, I'll keep going if you can keep going. Um, I want to talk about implementing component two, and that is reading for meaning. Go beyond reading comprehension when you're reading to your child. Start early. Read quality lit literature with them and have deep discussions that go you know, beyond comprehension. Ask open-ended questions and allow them to make mistakes you know, with, um, with maybe, maybe some of their answers might not be what you would have expected, but allow them to go through this process of thinking critically about what, they're, what you're reading to them and use age appropriate, of course, open-ended questions. Don't discount the power of picture books for older children. We have some wonderful picture books that, um, you know, cause children to write some beautiful things. I want to share with you um, a, a class I had a couple of years ago where I I use the Velveteen Rabbit. If you're not familiar with that book, I have it here somewhere. I have it here somewhere. The Velveteen Rabbit has a theme that's very clear for these early years, and that is that love makes you real. And I, I had children bring, you know, it's a, the little stuff bunny uh, one of the children gets for Christmas, and he starts getting shabby and pretty soon. Um, you know, he's kind of tossed aside and then the boy wants to have him back and he doesn't care that he's shabby, he loves him so much. At the end, the boy gets sick and all the toys have to go out. There's this sad part to it, warning. But I have the children bring their own stuffed animals and write about them. I wanna share with you just a few of these writings. Let me see here. This is, so this was a second grader. She writes, there was once a giraffe named Spots. Together we laughed and made music and we played and sang songs together. 
I loved him very much. Love makes you real. Once we went to a pretend forest and got wild berries and took baths in the lake. Sometimes we told stories at bedtime and thought about stuff. I kept him in my bed so I knew where he was and I knew I could sleep with him. I took him to the park and we played and have fun. Do you see how much this child is writing? As time went by, he got dirty and he became so filthy, but I still loved him. Love makes you real. One day my mom was going to wash him, but I needed him. I loved him so much. I wish he was still with me. I felt happy with him. But then I saw that he was really getting filthy and I kind of did not want to play with him. <laughs> My spots is still with me. That was the name of the animal. I still sleep with him and play with him. I love spots so much. Love makes you real and lasts forever. And did you notice that I gave them a little push here and there. We did this over a few days and I gave them a little push when they were stuck with a sentence starter. And that's a good help for children at this age, seven or eight years old. Let me close that out, go back here. Can you see my screen again, folks? Julie? Yes, you're good. Okay. Your children are going to be asked in their curriculum to, to do more than just read something and comprehend it. They're going to be asked to analyze things like theme. So um, I, I have two books I use with this. One is um, at times, what do you do with a problem? And what do you do? And, and the most magnificent thing. What do you do with a problem? The most magnificent thing. But you can use any two books that you feel have a similar thing. And this one is Perseverance. And we had great discussions with this, you know, about not giving up. And these are also, these books, by the way, what do you do with a problem? What do you do with an idea? What do you do with a chance? They're wonderful ways to talk about metaphors because the, you know, in figurative language, but the illustrations in these are great um, uh, discussion starters for metaphors, which they're going to be asked later about, you know, later. Okay, another one I love is Frederick. And I'm going over, I know some of you will have to go, but I just wanted to finish this one up. Um, Frederick is, is a book that I use in class a lot to uh, get kids talking and even arguing a bit. We want kids to be able to, to feel free to have a, um, you know, a contrasting perspective. And so, you know, Frederick's this little poet. And in the beginning, all the mice are gather, gathering corn and grain. And Frederick, they ask, why aren't you working, Frederick? And he says, I'm gathering words. And another time he's gathering colors. So, you know, the kids stop and say, why isn't he working? Why isn't he helping? At the end of the story, all the grain, all the corn's gone and there's nothing but Frederick. And they say, Frederick, where are your supplies? And of course, Frederick recites poetry and helps them to imagine the colors. And, um, and we talk about it at the end, you know, and I ask, do you think Frederick was working? Do you, and some of them still say no. They were like, no, that's not going down at my house. You know, he should have been helping. And others say, yes, I think that his work was valuable. And that's okay. Okay. Oh, my. Motivation to write. We haven't even got to this yet. I want to share uh, one of Alana's short videos with you while we still have a little bit of time. And I just want to say that aesthetics matter. I'm so jelly of her classroom there if you if you had looked in the background so jelly as my daughter used to say of how she set it up but if you don't have a school room or even a, a house you have an apartment create a place for your children to write 
that's an alternative to the kitchen table. You know, maybe under the table, create a tent surrounded by their stuffed animals. Get a clipboard. Aesthetics matter. Let me show you this one. Okay. Writing is a skill that so many children struggle with. Adults Thank too, you. but it shouldn't be drudgery. Many of our kids are perfectionists and they struggle with writing because they want to get it just right. There are those too who suffer from writing paralysis because they feel like they don't have any ideas to share. Some are even totally overwhelmed at the idea of getting pencil to paper because it requires two cognitive processes working at the same time. Fine motor control and dexterity to print and worthwhile ideas to share in a connected and refined way. Hi, I'm Alana, founder of Artful Teaching, Joyful Learning, and I help homeschoolers teach with confidence, ease, and a splash of creativity so that their kids fall in love with learning. When I taught kindergarten, I learned some amazing tricks of the trade. Through my years of experience teaching hundreds of children, many of them reluctant, I honed my teacher toolbox with tried and true strategies. James Britton once said, writing floats on a sea of talk. Oral language must precede the written word. If we want to get our kids writing and excited about it, they need to have many opportunities to share, to tell stories, and to narrate their play. These oral stories become fodder for your children's writing. Here are three ways that you can use language as a springboard to writing original stories with young children. The first is small world play. Invite your child to create their own small world. Offer them materials like sand and pebbles and mini trees, loose parts, and of course, characters to bring their playscape to life. You'll hear your child tell all kinds of stories with these characters. Invite your child to recreate the story through pictures and words in his notebook. The second strategy is through imaginative play. You'll notice your child playing fire station with his trucks or restaurant with his dolls and his stuffed animals. Hone in on the language he's using to narrate his play. Take a few notes and revisit these words with your child later in the day. Ask him to share a story about playtime. You can scribe some of the words that he shares or have him label his drawing with the beginning sounds that he hears. Go ahead and reinforce those letters, paying careful attention to the initial letter sounds. Fire truck, he might hear a f and restaurant might hear a r r. -r. A third strategy to encourage storytelling is through a sharing circle. Now this ritual is considered traditional practice amongst many indigenous cultures. A sharing circle is a beautiful practice to engage in storytelling and speaking skills. Now, as a token to encourage speaking, create a talking stick. A talking stick is a simple tool that is passed around the circle and gives the speaker a voice. You can use a simple frame like, what was the favorite part of your day or weekend? Or let's share a favorite memory about a family vacation. Once your child has had a chance to share, Encourage him to write his thoughts on paper through a picture and a few simple words or letters. Now, another strategy that's very popular amongst early years classrooms is a writing center. A writing center is a dedicated space or basket of supplies to inspire our children to get pen to paper, offering special non-traditional supplies above and beyond pencil and paper motivates and excites our kids and encourages them to share their ideas in published works. You can offer many different unexpected writing supplies, pens, fancy pencils, markers, stamps, offer a variety of paper cut in many different sizes. You can offer post-it notes, envelopes, index cards, lined paper, blank paper, notepads for shopping lists. You can offer a clipboard, and perhaps even a child-made mailbox. I always like to include an alphabet cheat sheet, as well as a list of commonly used sight words. A stapler, some stickers, and some yarn are great ways to also encourage handmade bookmaking. And speaking of bookmaking, there are many different beautiful handmade book structures to make with young children. A handmade book is a beautiful invitation 
begging to be filled with ideas. Jokes, riddles, how-tos, recipes, autobiographies. These are just some of the possibilities to fill your child's works of art. Now, it's really important to remember what writing looks like in the early years. Initially, writing is going to look like a bunch of random squiggles and marks. And this is totally normal. Your child is beginning to understand that print conveys meaning. As children progress and want to share more, you can encourage them to draw their ideas. And as children grow more confident with their letters and sounds, you can ask them to label their pictures with the beginning sound and later the ending and middle sounds. With time, they will learn to string those words together for a full sentence and then later build on that sentence, writing full paragraphs. Now, it's so important to note that writing is the creative expression of ideas. Writing in the early years is not the time to focus on proper letter formation or penmanship, nor is it the time to focus on conventional spelling. Rather, encouraging our kids to share stories and to write about what they know and things that excite and interest them is the best way to encourage your budding writers. Now, if you want to know more about tried and true strategies to teach your child to write and read in playful, simple ways backed with research, come and join me for my live workshop called Teach Your Child to Read and Write. It's being hosted live on November 3rd at 8 p.m. Central. And you'll have... Okay. And we missed that, of course. Um, and those are, uh, again, it, it requires a charge, but she gives a lot of freebies. So I encourage you to go to that site. Julie, can you see this okay? Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm going to keep going. Those of you that have to drop off, that's okay. We're recording this and we will uh, have it available for you at some point. So I, I just want to impress upon you that this what happens when your minds are engaged in the writing topic is huge. Um, and when you can connect to field trips, to the child's own experience, did you see how Alana was doing that, uh, building on their play? You know, Piaget said, a child's work is play. I had another when I was going to share with you, but for the sake of time, I'm not. And that was a little book on more on typical writing. But know this, I want to I want to talk a little bit about assessments. Assessments should drive instruction, but provide some alternatives to traditional evaluations and assessments. And remember, not everything has to be evaluated. Provide some time for them to self-correct through response journals. And you can have a great fun with this. In one classroom I had, I had it uh, created out of just paper, this owl that was at the top of a pillar, which looked like, you know, I created to make like a tree. And we called her Miss Feathers. And the kids would write letters to Miss Feathers. Now they knew that it was probably me or somebody else. We had, I had so many letters that I had to recruit other teachers to help me respond to them. But I had them, and these were second, third graders, I believe. I had them choose a, choose what they were going to write about, not just, you know, writing anything. So they checked one of these boxes. So here is, a, again, a sneaky way to evaluate writing and help them uh, correct their own mistakes. Maybe not for that piece of writing, but for later on. So they would write to me. It was a dear Miss Feathers letter. I would like to have a bunny. I have a brown dog. I knew this was brown dog and a white cat, but I would like to have a bunny. So I would write back to them. Dear Allison, I have a brown dog too. You see, they were so excited to get a letter from Mrs. Feathers that they would look carefully at those words and realize, ah, I spelled that wrong. We might not even have a conversation about it, but it was effective. We would keep writing back and forth, and I would see the corrections in their future uh, letters. Okay, it, homeschoolers, have your child, uh, you know, self-correct while you're doing the dishes, folding the laundry. They will do this on your on their own. 
you'll be doing the dishes and the, the, you'll, you say, oh, I don't have time to sit down. Just read it aloud to me and have a clipboard and a sharp pencil and eraser handy. They will catch their mistakes as they're reading aloud to you. And know this, that we're looking for patterns of mistakes. They're going to have a lot of mistakes at these ages. So instead of maybe taking a red pen and you know marking everyone, get a little sticky note and note that they're having uh, difficulty with say that suffix, instead of ed, they're ending it with t. Every time, or at least most of the time, they're making that mistake. And so that's a lesson for the next day. Um, let me see here. Be sure as they get older, so maybe they're advancing and, uh, you know, they're advancing in their ability to, to respond to what they've read, to write. And now we're going to start asking them for a little more. Be sure you're clear to them when you want them to write a draft. That means that you expect there's going to be mistakes in it. Just get your thoughts out, I always tell kids. Just get, we'll go back and fix it up in the next draft. So here is a typical uh, third grade essay from a child that's moving along pretty well. And you can see that there are some patterns of mistakes here. If we had more time and in person, I would usually have uh, parents sitting together and finding those patterns. Um, let's see here. Be sure when you are going through an evaluation, you know, some kind of alternate evaluation, that you first engage in the content of the book. Even if it's hard to find something positive, just, you know, if they wrote about their favorite book, say, oh, I love that book too. And, you know, begin, you know, I always like the sandwich uh, concept. Begin with something positive and something complimentary about the writing and then move into what we might need to correct for the next draft. Okay. And here are just some examples of what you can ask them, you know, why don't you go back and make sure you got all your punctuation correct in that draft. Allow your child to make mistakes and self-correct and just know you, we're not expecting perfection at this. We're looking for patterns of mistakes that we can correct in future lessons. <sighs> Couple more things. Um, I, I can't stress enough how important it is to integrate art into your literacy program. Point to books with great illustrations. I have this book here. I was going to share with you a little bit, and it's When Sophie Gets Angry. And these illustrations are just so beautiful. She And you can talk to the kids. You know, why did the illustrator use this red background? to express anger. And again, we have a great uh, springboard for talking about metaphors. You know, Sophie is ready to explode. She's a volcano. And you can get them to write about what did, what did the author mean there? Is she really going to turn into a volcano? And they love to do this with beautifully illustrated books. So here's just a few little pictures. I, I've taught puppetry um, uh, in, as a way to supplement literacy. And look at the setting. I don't know if you can see, but on the right, this was one of our little students, Sean or Shane. Sean or Shane? Let me see. Which year was this? I had both of those boys, those brothers. But look at the setting of this. He's made a town down there. And, you know, this is just a, a great opportunity for them to uh, retell a story. Integrate science as a way to encourage writing. Observational journals at the zoo or other field trips. Um, ask them to structure a hypothesis of an experiment. Let me see here. So, you know, we're looking at uh, scaffolding 
So you're modeling this in the early years and later on they'll be able to do these things on their own. Making inferences, you can teach how to make an inference in the early years with very simple stories. Finding evidence in a story. Why do you think that? What's your evidence? Why do you think that character was motivated to do such and such? What are you using as evidence? And just talking about it, pointing it out so that later on those terms are not, you know, a foreign language to them. Lastly, some parents, second, third grade, uh, you're not seeing a lot of progress and you wonder, should I be concerned there is a special need? So consider the following. How old is your child? Is your child taking any medication? Has it changed recently? Does your child appear to be repeatedly stressed about the assignments or school in general? Is this happening at different times of the day or various days? Are there other factors that might be affecting your child's approach to the work? Vision, hearing, trauma, that's the first thing um, anybody will look at when they're you know, considering a meeting to discuss an assessment. Have you considered curriculum that is a year behind or a year ahead of the current curriculum or another curriculum altogether? And your advising teacher will help you uh, try to make these decisions. If there is a special need, know that there's a process. There's meetings to discuss early interventions before we move on to other options. And from there, uh, from there, you can, you know, you can, we'll be making decisions as a team. So, and my last recommendation to you is to remember why you chose to homeschool. Use the flexibility you have. Take advantage of unique and spontaneous experiences that come about. You will be amazed at the writing you get when you take advantage of a spontaneous moment, like a rainbow. Thank you for coming. I'm so sorry I went over. Thank you to staff for sitting in on this for not 30 minutes, but an hour. Here's some additional resources and I have some handouts for you. Just email me if you'd like me to, to send them over. Thank you.